All right. So uh, this is section 3.3, and uh, the title of this section is actually is not uh, does not uh, actually convey what's in this section. The title is called uh, "Good Back Judge." All right. And uh, so uh, here are the objectives of uh, this section. First, we're gonna actually uh, give more questions and answers about the sequence of primes. We already uh, done this earlier when we proved that there are infinitely many primes. So we're going to continue actually asking about uh, different types of the question concerning primes. Then we're going to give a list of conjectures concerning primes. Among these conjectures will be called back conjecture, which I actually did state uh, at the very first lecture. Uh, then we're going to look at primes in a special types of sequences called arithmetic sequences or arithmetic progressions. And among the uh, important results in this regard is a uh, theorem by Dershowitz. Uh, it's called Dershowitz theorem uh, for primes in, uh, uh, or in arithmetic progressions. Then we're going to end by stating one of the most important theorems in number theory, uh, which is called prime number theorem. Uh, of course, the proof of this theorem is way beyond uh, this course. Okay, so we just want to state the theorem and try to understand what the statement is. Uh, you know, it's a statement basically. All right. So let's get started with the first. There will be several questions that we're going to be asking about the primes. And maybe the very, the very first natural question is, is there a formula that gives us all the primes? Or to put it in a different way, is this. If B sub n is the nth prime in the sequence of prime, listed in In its natural order, in its natural order, is there a formula that uh, answer this question? Given n, then the formula should give p sub n. All right. So let's say, first of all, what do we mean by the primes are listed in their natural order? Okay, this means we start with a two, three, five. We know actually many, many, many primes, so these are listed in their natural order. So, uh, so this is going to be P1, the first one, this is P2, this is P3, and somewhere in here, okay, is Pn, maybe P100. And of course, we continue with it. So, what this question is, we put it as question number one is there a formula? And this formula is going to depend, of course, on n. So, given an n, plug n in this formula, all right, and it should give you what is the nth prime, all right, the 100th prime, and so on. The uh, answer to this question is no. There is 
no formula exists. No such formula. exist or can be even discovered, can be found. Now there is no hope to be able uh, to answer this question. So let's go with a less demanding question, all right? We may ask, is there an algebraic formula that gives just the prime number? Okay, is there, second the question, not all the primes, just the values that uh, uh, are produced by this formula only give a price. All right. So if I cannot get all the primes, let's see if I can, uh, you know, have a formula that give me just the primes. Okay. Question number two, is there an algebraic or a simple, a simple, well, this is between parentheses in here, a simple algebraic formula that just yield, uh, I mean, or just generates by that word, the word here, prime number. explain what we mean by an algebraic formula. Algebraic formula is simply a formula that involves the four algebraic operations, addition, multiplication, division, subtraction, all right? And simple, well, that's very hard to define, but among the simple algebraic formulas are those given by a polynomial, all right? So this is why I have in mind in mind, maybe it's like a polynomial. All right, uh, polynomial with integer coefficients, okay, in one variable or more than one variable. And it turns out we have a theorem which says that, unfortunately, no, there is no just a polynomial when you evaluate this polynomial for different values of a natural natural numbers or natural numbers, then it would have produced some prime, but at the same time, not only prime. There will be, you know, actually composite numbers, or in you know, more generally you're gonna see that it actually generates infinitely many uh, composite numbers. All right, here is the theorem. Okay, that just to state this. And it says that uh, no polynomial uh, in one variable with coefficients in Z, I mean being integers, that only generates prime numbers. By evaluating polynomial for uh, different values from Z. Or equivalently, we can state this, so equivalently, For any 
polynomial. And let me actually name this uh, f of x equal a sub k x to the k plus a k minus 1 x k one and so on plus a one x plus a sub zero. Where this, for those of you who uh, know the set of uh, polynomials with offset in z, you have set in z of x. What does this mean? Okay, this means these polynomials where these a sub i they all belongs to z, all right? So for any polynomial that uh, there exists, says, we say what well, I want to say in here now, an integer c uh, such that uh, f of c is composite. Now, I may actually write this in way on the top in here. Okay, so let me... Okay, so let me write the conclusion in here. Alright, so... Uh, so we have for any polynomial, all right, where integer coefficients there exist, there exist uh, a c in z such that f of c is composite. In fact. There are infinitely many many there are infinitely many values of x in Z such that I can actually put this is C here, okay? I, I don't want to confuse between the uh, determinant variable C here, such that uh, F of C is composite. Not just one, or a finite, you know, finitely many, there are infinitely many, okay? All right.
So this implies that, uh, again, this means f of m, which is equal to a sub k, m to the k, k minus 1, uh, m k minus 1, and so on. If a is 1, m plus a sub 0 is equal to 2. Well, we're going to net x sub n. We're going to define a uh, set of numbers, all right, by this. x sub n is equal to m plus n p, where n are 1, 2, 3, and so on. Then we're going to evaluate the uh, the polynomial at this uh, set of numbers, okay, so we're going to look at this, and of course this is a sub k, m plus n p to the power k, plus and so, k minus 1, m plus n p to the power k minus 1, and the last one is going to be, let me put k1, m plus n p, now we can expand each one of these uh, binomials, all right? And I know for sure I'm going to get a to the k m k. Just I want to take the first term of each one of these binomials, and then there are other terms. They're going to be actually multiples of p and m, all right? And then the next one from the second one is going to be a k minus one m to the power k minus 1, and so on, and uh, last, before, the term before the last is going to be a1m plus a sub 0, so I'm going to put this one in all of this, plus sum of terms that are multiples, that are multiples, of p. In other words, they have p in each one of these steps. Okay, some then they contain a p in each one of them. Alright, now this expression in here, this is actually f of m. I'm putting the f from f of m. And since in here this sum, each one of the terms, alright, in the remaining terms is going to have a p as a factor. So this is, I'm going to write it P multiplied by another formula, let me call it G. And this G is going to also depend on M. Uh, actually, it's going to be, depends also in, uh, let me see exactly what I want to say. It depends on N, okay? So it kind of depends in both, actually, N and F. Okay? You just put N in. All right. Now uh, this implies that, or this is equal. Now the first term f of m we know this is equal p. Okay, this is what we uh, actually assumed about the value of uh, the f at m, and then we can factor it out, and we have actually. Uh, uh, let me I will write this plus p g over m. All right. Uh, now. We can factor a p out. So this is what we have. We have this f m plus n p is equal p multiplied by one plus g of n. All right, which means that. This implies P divides the value of M plus N. And this means, again, that this is composite. All right? 
Now, in here, I assume the kind of like add is one of the numbers. It's a fixed number, but it could be one, two, three, and so on. All right? Uh, now, by changing this, you're going to end up with different values in here. And the question is, uh, does this mean that we have actually infinitely many? Well, we need a little argument in here to make it uh, clearer. All right, so if you know that uh, g of n is a polynomial itself, all right, with leading coefficient. Actually, it's a polynomial. I don't care even about what's the leading coefficient is. It's a polynomial, all right? Now, if I take the limit of this, So taking the limit of this as n goes to infinity, all right, then this actually becomes infinite. What does this mean? This means that for some value, or large value basically, some value uh, of n, let's say, n sub 0, we have that g of n is bigger than actually any prescribed number, because when it goes to infinity, it means given any number, always the g of n is going to be bigger than that. So let me just say this is bigger than 1 for every n bigger than or equal n sub 0. So in other words, now we have for every n bigger than or equal to n sub 0, this p, all right, is going to divide f of m plus np, all right? And this means that f of m plus np is composite. for all n bigger than or equal to n0. And there are infinitely many values, okay, bigger than or equal to a certain, uh, you know, natural number, basically. All right? So hence, there are infinitely many composites. Hence, there are infinitely many composite values of f of x. All right? It is also possible, or it is also true, that if you consider polynomials of n variables, more than one variable, turns out the proof is a little more involved. All right? Actually, this statement is still holds. Let me just put it as a remark. And moreover, or remark, for polynomials and several variables. The statement of the theorem of the previous theorem is it? So, in other words, there are infinitely many composite values. Uh, for this uh, polynomial of several variables. Well, the question becomes, how about other formulas? How about, not simple, you might call it, how about other formulas? That just generate
Now, prime. Well, uh, in uh, 1947, in a tradition by the name of W, which I don't know what the W actually stands for, H. Mill, has shown there is a constant shown there exists a constant R such that F of n, which is equal by the greatest integer function, then we can be discussing later on, but if you know what the greatest integer function is, r raised to the third, 3 to the n, this formula. So this gives you actually the integers less than or equal to this quantity, okay, inside. So for example, uh, if you look at uh, 3.5, 3.1, 3.6, and so on, the greatest integer for that is going to be just different. A number that the largest number that is smaller than, okay, that the integer is different. All right. Uh, so he said that, that this actually generates, okay, only problems. Only R. The exact value of R is not known. The exact value of R is not known. There are some approximate values of R, okay, that are given. So I'm going to write the approximate value. So here's an approximation. Only approximate. Values of R are known. One of these is R approximately equal 1.3064. Or right, you might try yourself, you know, to see using this approximate value and the calculator to calculate So you're going to raise this is to the third to the n. All right. So you just evaluate this for different values of n. Now we're going to see that uh, this again generates only primes. Okay. And uh, the problem with this is, in order to uh, use this formula, you really need to know the primes. Okay, once you obtain one, you know, this is one of the primes or not. But in other words, from a practical point of view, this formula is not useful. Okay, so from a practical point of view, this is not really a useful formula. Now, back in the 17th century, okay, the great mathematician Fermat, Conjecture that this formula, the following formula, actually also generates prime. Okay? So this is the 17th century.
Fermat. Conjecture the following. Fermat. That F sub M, which is equal to uh, 2 to the power 2 to the power m plus 1 is, is a prime for every n, m, sorry, bigger than or equal to, uh, let me see, actually, bigger than or equal even to 0. All right? In fact, Fermat justified this or calculated the first four values of this formula, which is, or five values, right? F of 0, which is equal to 2 to the power, two, 2 to the power 0 plus 1, is going to be equal to 3, which is, of course, is a prime. Then he calculated f of 1, and this is equal to 5, also prime. Then, uh, as you see, the primes that we're producing in here, they are not going to be the consecutive primes, because when you look at f2, Two to the four plus one is seventeen. Okay, so we jumped a few primes. Then uh, F three. Of course, I'm just going to write the values of these. They start getting bigger, not very big. Two fifty seven. And uh, we have F four. And again, this is a prime, by the way. F four. Plus six, five, five, three, seven. Also, this is a prime. And Fermat stopped. That's it. He stopped in here and he declared, all right, he made a conjecture, made a statement, all right, for him, actually, he's made it as a theory that uh, any, for any m bigger than or equal to zero, this produces, uh, it's a prime. Okay, it's a problem. Then in the, 17th, in the 18th century, about 100 years later, Euler, a great Swiss mathematician Euler, uh, calculated F5. It's 2 to the 2 to the 5 plus 1. And he proved it, <laughs> or it turns out the number that is equal to this is, is this number, 4, uh, 2, 9, 4, we put comments in here, then 9, 6, 7, 2, 97. Okay, big number. And this number, it turns out this is not a prime. Actually, he proved, he only found one of the factors of this number. He found that that 641 divides this number, F5. And then Fermat's conjecture or Fermat's statement that uh, this generates uh, just the prime numbers is an incorrect statement. All right? Now, these numbers become very, very important, okay? Nowadays, these numbers are called, numbers of this form are called Fermat numbers, okay? So, numbers of this form numbers of this form here are called Fermat now 
Now, if it happens that this one is a prime, if m is a prime for some m in n, we call fm a fair map prime. Now the question is, are there are there finite remedy? or infinite limit. Fair map primes. The answer to this question is unknown. Okay, so this is an open problem. In fact, a lot of the factorization techniques or primality test, tests actually uh, that are used to determine whether a number is a prime or is composite attempt to solve or find you know more of fair math primes. There are only a few a few actually fair map numbers which are known to be primes. So in other words, fair map from Jackson maybe, well he said it's a prime, but actually doesn't see if there are, uh, you know, actually, uh, what we call, there are very few, all right, of, of uh, fair map numbers that are known to be actually, uh, let me see, I turn it. Me remember what it is uh, to be composite. Okay, uh, I could be wrong. I, it, it, it's one of these. There are very few of one kind over the other. Okay, uh, please check that. Uh, anyway, so uh, so here it is. So it is not known whether it is there are finitely many or infinitely many of these kinds of. Uh, All right, let's move on to uh, another question concerning primes. Of course, we have shown that there are infinitely many primes as well as there are infinitely many composites. Now, the question, if we examine the sequence of the primes, we're going to see that sometimes primes appear next to each other. Uh, means the distance between, or the number of uncomposite numbers between two primes is very short. Okay, so let me make a list. And then we will ask the question. Okay, so when we look at the list of primes, in their natural order and so on. So there is no, actually two is kind of the weird one in here, okay? This is, sometimes they say that uh, uh, two is the oddest prime, okay? Uh, anyway, so we have a three, five, of course these are odd, there will be between them, in, in the natural order, there will be the four. So these are very close to each other, very close to each other, means there's only one composite between these, there is uh, the eight, nine, and ten, so there are three, and from here to here only there is one, all right, and actually it continues. We're going to be 
classifying these numbers where you know between them there is only one composite that such primes are called twin primes and we're going to actually restate a conjecture concerning this but when you go farther in actually the sequence of all the primes you will see sometimes there would be a prime in here and there are many 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 composites a number before another prime appears okay so here's a prime and in the natural order there would be composites in here and then there is a another prime when such you know composite numbers appears between two prime people you know this is a gap okay between uh, you know, primes, gap between the primes. And there is nothing there as, as far. The next theorem states that given an n, whatever natural number is, you can find composite numbers, okay, of as many as this n. All right, without the consecutive numbers, and none of these numbers is a prime. So, in other words, you start with a prime in here somewhere, and then you would have n could be a thousand, could be a million, could be a billion. All right, with all of these are composite before you see another prime. Okay, so let's just take this uh, actually this theorem. Precisely. All right. And here it is. So this is a. Uh, this is the theorem. It said for any given natural number. N, there are at least in consecutive composite numbers. Uh, you know, we start with the very beginning. 
All right. So the proof of this theorem is very, very, very actually simple. So we're given this n. Now we're going to consider the uh, consecutive numbers in the list, which is we're going to start with n plus 1, and we're going to take the factorial of this plus 1. Uh, we start with, actually, we need to start with, with 2. We start with 2. Then the next number to this is going to be plus 3 and n plus 1 factorial plus 4 and so then n plus 1 factorial plus n and the last one is n plus 1 factorial plus n plus 1. Okay. So there is a list, this list of numbers, this has n, has n consecutive numbers. This numbers come after each other. Because they all start with this n plus 1 factorial. Regardless what's the value of this is, then 2, then you add to the same number 1, so it becomes plus 3, and so on. So these are good secret. I claim that all these numbers are in fact composite. Okay? So here's the claim. Now remember that these numbers are of this form. Then, for every k between 2 and n plus 1, n plus 1 factorial plus k, so this covers all of them, so remember this one is composite. And since there is n of them, then we are done with the proof of the theorem. Well, well, let's look at this. This is just, as I said, it's very simple. The n plus 1 factorial is the product of n plus 1, n, n minus 1, and so on. And eventually we're going to get to 1. But now since k is appearing is actually between 2 and 1, there will be a k here. k minus 1, then there is a k, and then k plus 1, and so on. Up to 2 times 1. Now, it is possible that k is equal to 2, alright? So, in this case, we get you know, have the k actually go all the way to the very end of this sequence. Or could k be very, very large, closer to this, or that's when it's equal to n plus 1, and then we have to continue to 1. Regardless where the k is, so it's going to be somewhere in between, you know, 2 and n plus 1, including this. All right? Now, then we're going to add to this k. Right? So this is the, the factorial and this is k. As you see, k is actually appearing in this product and in here. So this implies, yes, it does divide this expression and it may get a factor that is not the 3. Okay, so k. So here I can factor out the k, and we have n plus 1, and n minus 1, and so on, k minus 1, uh, k plus 1, up to 2 plus 1. 
Alright, so this implies there that K divides this N plus 1 factorial plus K and K bigger than or equal to 2. So this implies this N plus 1 factorial plus K is composite. For all k. So there are an uh, composite between without any in consecutive, all right, consecutive uh, composite numbers with no primes among them, of course. Let's look at uh, actually in the practice when we want to look at. Uh, Let's say I want to find, here, here's the question, okay? Here's the example. Get the n equal 7. So I need to find, all right, a list of seven composite numbers, a list of uh, seven consecutive composite numbers. That means seven numbers next to each other with all composite. Now by the theorem, we know seven plus one factorial plus two, which is just eight factorial, okay? So let me write this one is four, this is equal 8 factorial plus 2. Then the next one is 8 factorial plus 3. 8 factorial plus 4 and so on. Up to the last one, which is going to be 8 factorial plus 8. Which is n plus 1 factorial plus n plus 1. Alright? Now, if you look at the numerical values of these, these are very, very large. Let me say very large. I don't want to say make it very, very large. But the theorem guaranteed it. On the other hand, you could find a much, much, much smaller numbers, seven consecutive even or more. Alright? Composite numbers, their length is seven. Okay? So the theorem guarantees this, but the numbers in both in here are very large. So if n is equal 100, forget it. Even you, you know, to calculate 101 factorial and then start adding numbers to it. For example, uh, there are much smaller less of seven composite numbers this of consecutive consecutive composite numbers And one of these is here, I just have it, 90, this is composite, of course, 91, try to see which one is, this is composite, 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96. All of these are composite, 
Uh, there are seven of them, and they are, of course, consecutive. No, no prize. All right? So, in other words, from a practical point of view, the theorem is not quite practical. Okay? All right. The uh, next objective. So, here are some of the questions that uh, we said we're going to uh, list up concerning prime. So there will be more questions as we go you know, farther in the course, but at least at this stage, that's what it is, it's even for the products. All right, so here are uh, some conjectures, okay, about the products. So let's all conjecture. Um, A conjecture is a statement saying something is it true or not it true about you know, a mathematical statement, okay, even which could be not mathematical as well, where there is no mathematical proof or there is no proof has been uh, actually uh, given to show that the statement is it true or not it true. Once it's approved, then it becomes a theorem, and if someone comes up with a counter example, then it becomes not a theorem, okay, in that this conjecture is incorrect. And this is true even in other sciences, where someone could have a certain thing in, in, in physics, and unless you find an experiment, okay, that proves uh, other way, then it, you know, it will become a conjecture, all right? So it's either one or the other. All right. In fact, the uh, conjectures are, you know, actually number theory attracted, you know, mathematicians from all sort of, uh, you know, all types of mathematicians. Sometimes we call them professional mathematicians or amateur mathematicians. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, or the type of problems that attracted uh, more mathematicians is actually studying prime numbers. Uh, so uh, there are long lists of primes, and if someone examine or look at these lists of primes, they could ask different questions concerning them. You know, right? And uh, some of these questions have been answered, and there are others being unsolved for hundreds of years, okay, and most of these, or all of them, basically, are very easy to understand, and maybe you might take a crack at uh, trying to, you know, solve one of these uh, conjectures or these open problems. All right, uh, let me start with uh, one of these conjectures. I'm going to have a, a big, you know, a list of uh, four or five in here. All right, so this is the first one. It's called Bertrand. Bertrand's uh, conjecture. It was stated by Joseph uh, Bertrand in 1845, uh, a uh, French mathematician, and stated uh, the following. This is the statement. For every n, Bigger than one, a natural number, the same one in here. There is a prime p such between basically n and two n. All right. So given n, always there is a prime, all right, between n and 2n. For example, when we take n, at least one prime, there is, when we say a prime, it's at least one prime, okay? So if we take n equal to 5, then when we take 5 and 10, we know that there are actually several primes in here. 
let me see, have several primes or one prime actually? We have only seven, so there is a prime seven. In here. And of course, when the n gets larger, there will be definitely more primes. All right? But always there will be one prime between n and n. So a very, very simple statement. Unfortunately, there is no proof for this. All right? And of course, now with computers and so on, this conjecture has been tested, means, and still remains true, means always, uh, you know, you could find a prime between uh, n and twice n. All right? Even with, you know, hundreds and millions of values of, of t, this will not constitute a proof. All right? You have to cut up with the mathematical proof. Uh, you know, without, uh, in other words, numerically will not uh, constitute a proof. It sometimes makes the conjecture stronger, means to believe that this is true, but a, a you know, a proof needs to be uh, supplied. All right, the uh, second problem, actually, we did uh, uh, talk about this earlier, that is, we call the twin. The prime's conjecture. And this one says there are, this is the statement of the conjecture. There are infinitely many many pairs of Primes B and two B in the sequence of the primes. As you know, uh, of course, in here. The first number that apply, uh, sorry, this is p plus two, not not two p. Two p itself is not a prime. Okay, so this is p plus. Two. All right, and again, when you look at the first when the prime. All right, is actually three five, and then five seven, then seven. And the next prime is not, so 7 and 11, so this is not, and so on. So what this conjecture is saying, there are infinitely many. And again, this conjecture, or, you know, this has been tested for very, very, very large values of other primes. To look at an other prime, and then to look at uh, B plus Two and see if it's a prime or not. Then now there are more of twin primes, you know, for smaller values, okay, of p. But when we go farther and farther in the sequence of prime, they become, you know, more rare. But however, still they found the twin primes that they have hundreds of digits means it doesn't mean that you know they become rare you know for large values means you know they're gonna stop basically still they are discovering more of what we call these twin primes all right now uh, on the other hand there is what we call prime triplets We have the prime triplets uh, Let me see in here
Uh, all right, then one way to define, you know, uh, the prime triplets, okay, similar to start with P, then P plus 2, P plus 4. Okay, it turns out if we define prime triplets this way, there is only one, and I wrote this one in the, I don't know, lecture one, two, at the very beginning, there is only one such triplet. And this one is the three, Five, seven. Okay, so this is P, this is P plus two, this is P plus four. Alright? This is only one like this. So that's not very exciting. So uh, there's another way the uh, prime triplets are defined. So then we have P, P plus two. And let me make sure that I put it, in, yeah, and B plus 6. So we skip, kind of. And the question here, which is still unanswered, are there infinitely many? Many such. Okay. Now this is again an open problem, second chapter, uh, we say it's not known. Are there finitely many or infinitely many? Okay. Okay, let's look at uh, another conjecture. This is called Teradish. The uh, very Big name in number theory, and combinatorics, and many other branches of mathematics. He is a Hungarian mathematician. Surely he doesn't have. He passed away a few years ago. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't have a, a home. In other words, he kept traveling from one country to the other. Sometimes he would be in three different content, uh, continents in about a week, all right? So here's the third, go to the dish. Uh, for every, so the conjunctor says for every, Natural number can bigger than or equal is three. There is an arithmetic progression of primes with links n. Okay, uh, the technical definition of arithmetic progression will be given later on when we talk about the uh, Dirschmitt or right here, but it's a set of numbers, let's say, they come in in a regular way, let's put it this way. So what is Ernest uh, saying that given any n bigger than or equal to 3, always we can find, you know, some arithmetic progression where all the terms of this 
arithmetic progression are actually primes. And the length of this is n. For example, if you take a n equal 5, then this progression is it starts with 5, you know, this time, and then 11, 17, 23, 29. There are five of these, are, these are all the primes. And each one, starting from 5 to, to get to 11, we are adding 6. Going from here to there, we are adding 6 to 11, and so on. All right, so this is what we mean by arithmetic progression is we start with a number and then we add a fixed value to every number that comes uh, next to it. So we call the six here different common difference. Okay. Common difference. Another logic of uh, arithmetic progression that contains 10, right, and again, with that with computers nowadays, uh, this has been uh, checked for larger value of n, and there's a, you know, all these support the conjecture. And uh, here's one other example. Let's start with 199, 4059, and 619, and so on. And the difference quotient in here, D, is actually 210. Okay? So each, if you keep adding 210 to each one of these numbers, and to the last one in here, which is 2089, again, all of these are primes, and there are 10 of them. All right? Next, we're going to state another conjecture that is uh, number four, and this is referred to as Goldbach conjecture. Goes back with the actor. This conjecture was proposed in 1742, and you can tell how many years has passed, and still unsolved. Okay. It was stated by Goldbach in a letter that he sent to Oil. All right? The letter basically stating that he uh, believed that, you know, the following statement actually is true. He's asking him, uh, is, that, is, is there a proof for this? I know the exact statement, of course, of the letter, but in it, he would actually make this statement. And that's what it is. So the judge said every even integer n bigger than 2 can be written as a sum of two primes. Of course, not necessarily these primes are the state. They could be the same prime as is added. All right? So again, a very simple statement to understand and even try to play with it to check it for a few values of n. You know, even. even integers, and, uh, but 
there is no proof for it. And it's been, you know, again, uh, verified for very, very, very large value and which means, you know, there is a strong support that the conjecture may be true. Uh, for example, when you take 10, it can be expressed only in one way. Uh, actually, two ways, sorry, 5 plus 5. Uh, we have repetition here. And you look at the 24, there's three ways we could write the 24. Uh, 5 plus 19, 7 plus 17, and 11 plus 13. All right? And of course, you could continue with other numbers. So, but at least always we can write an even integer as a sum of two primes. Now, in early times, there was a theorem that was approved, all right, that uh, make the conjecture more classical than being actually a correct, but still a complete proof of the conjecture is not at hand, okay? Uh, here is a, a Russian mathematician by the name of, I, I'll write, the, write it down, Bingo Kradov, okay? Uh, he showed the following there. If this function a of x stands for the number of even integers less than or equal to x that are not the sum of two primes So in other words, these are the numbers that do not satisfy basically a gold bar conjecture. Uh, these are the numbers less than or equal to x. So, so this is what the A of x stands for. All right? Then this is what he showed. Then uh, he showed the limit as x goes to infinity of a of x divided by x is equal to 0. Let's try to understand what does this uh, actually say. Now, when a limit of a ratio goes to 0 means the numerator is going to actually, uh, sorry, the denominator is going to grow much faster than the numerator, okay? So the x, this x gets larger than, or gets larger faster than, gets larger faster than a of x. Okay, so the x are the, okay, so this is the number of even integer rest of about, so this is a natural number, so if I want to look at, let's say, a of 10,000, all right, and what we are saying that the, uh, so the number of those even integers that are less than 10,000, okay, if I take the ratio of the, that they are not, can be, cannot be expressed, as a sum of two primes, all right, they can uh, compare this to, uh, to the x, okay, to the 10,000, this is actually is, is just equal to zero, it's very, very, very small, which means that almost, so this is equivalent to saying that almost, uh, or for large values of n for or for almost all let me say actually for large values supposedly uh, 
uh, almost all the even integers satisfy a uh, good back conjecture. Okay, so that's what it means. In other words, the uh, these compared with the, the numbers is, uh, you know, this is negligible basically. This is very, very small, they do not satisfy, okay? Uh, so that's what this uh, uh, limit here. Yeah. Kind of an interpretation of it. All right, one other couple of, uh, one other conjecture. This is uh, the great uh, French mathematician Lejeune. All right, and that's the John's conjecture. Okay, number five. Again, this goes back to the uh, 19th century, the 1800s. All right, and uh, stated that there are. Or there is a prime number between any pair of consecutive squares. Actually, doesn't work. 
All right. Uh, looks like I'm going to stop right here. There are a few other things in uh, this section that I need to uh, do another lecture on. All right. So I'm going to stop for the time being here.